Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I am Charlie Sykes. This is the final full week of the Trump presidency. It is also the week that uh, Donald Trump is likely to be impeached for the second time in one term, making him the first president ever to be impeached twice. So joining us to sort all of this out is uh, Kim Whaley, who is our resident constitutional scholar. Kim, happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, Charlie. So Could happy just- to be talking to you. Well, let's let's just talk about where we're at right now. And I and I I wrote this in my newsletter this morning. You know, obviously, if you've been a Trump critic, there's a sense of vindication watching what's happening. But but I have to tell you, it's almost overwhelmed by a sense of frustration because we have been warning people for so many years about all of this. This whole notion that somehow, wow, this is amazing. We are shocked, shocked to find out that uh, that this lying narcissist, conspiracy theorist, uh, you know, is, is a wannabe autocrat. I mean, they're, they're just shocked by this. But I mean, how many times have we told people, warned the, the Republican Party, this is who he is. He's told us who he is. This is going to end badly. And so, yeah, there's a there's a sense of vindication, but there's a sense of frustration about fellow Republicans and conservatives. What were you thinking? How did you not see that it was going in this direction? Do you know what I mean, Kim? No, I agree. I mean, the the chorus in my mind, and you know, I know this isn't always popular in regular life, is the "I told you so." I told you so. You know, this is not just the last few weeks when, and I know you mentioned this in your newsletter. 138 Republicans joined mm-hmm. a lawsuit to literally take votes away from the American people and hand them to politicians. Uh, But this started way back with the Mueller investigation. And then, you know, the the impeachment process over and over and over that you ignore the guardrails of democracy at your own peril. And this is also, you know, not new to history. I mean, there have been many scholar, historical uh, historians that have talked about the fall from democracy to something like authoritarianism, and Donald Trump is straight out of the playbook. And so, yeah, I feel frustrated as well, Charlie, that well, somehow we, and, people are acting this like this is shocking. Yeah, we're not going to get any apologies or anything, but I mean, there was a lot of mockery, a lot of like, oh no, it's you, you got you suffer from Trump derangement syndrome. And yeah, I, I had it at cocktail parties. People, oh, you're exaggerating. And I, you know, frankly, I've had friends come back and say, you know what, that 18 months ago when we were chatting, you were right. And I, again, I hate to be, we, you know, told know, you so, but, but, but I mean, and I think what's important in this moment is that we now pay attention to this because as I, you also mentioned in your newsletter, we are not out of the woods. No, no, they're not, not at all. They're planning demonstrations on the 17th, maybe the 20th. And I do think that this last two months has been kind of a microcosm of the last four years. Julie Pace uh, from the AP has a great analysis this morning. Can I just read a little bit of it? At the heart of the violent insurrection at the U.S. Capitol was a lie. One that was allowed to fester and flourish by many of the same Republicans now condemning President Donald Trump for whipping his supporters into a frenzy with his false attacks on the integrity of the 2020 election. The response from some of those GOP officials now, we didn't think it would come to this. And, you know, Mick Mulvaney, I didn't think people would take him literally. Well, that argument, she writes, reveals the extent to which many Republicans have willingly turned a blind eye throughout Trump's presidency to some of the forces coursing through America. Each time Trump promoted a conspiracy theory or openly flirted with extremist groups, Republicans assumed there were still some limits on how far uh, even he and his most loyal supporters would go. Few seem concerned about the worst case scenarios, dismissing fears of violence or authoritarianism as liberal fever dreams. And here we are right now. Yeah, I was chatting with our friend uh, A.B. Stoddard about this. I know she's on your podcast Mm -hmm. pretty frequently. And, you know, what's amazing is is the interviews of the people, some of the people on the Capitol on January 6th who believed, believed two things. One, believed that the election was literally stolen from Joe Biden, that there was widespread fraud, notwithstanding 60 plus lawsuits, 90 fed, uh, judges, you know, across the political spectrum, zero, zero, zero evidence. And number two, they believed that Congress has the constitutional power to snatch election results from we the people through the Electoral College and hand it to Donald Trump. Why do they believe those two things? Not just because Donald Trump 
has been spewing those lies, but because the Republican Party, in large part, has been spewing those lies as well. So to say, listen, we've we've been part of the duping of the American people along the right end of the political spectrum, uh, but we have no accountability for it. They need to come out and say, we were wrong in telling you those things. We will go back to truth and the rule of law. Because until that happens, these people believe in their bones that what they're doing is righteous because they were lied to. And, and that's they, new. And they represent millions of people. This is a really important point. Actually, here, here's an article I'm not going to write, which would be sort of in defense of the rioters, because I'm, I don't want to be misunderstood here. But, you know, yes, that they need to be held accountable. And yes, there's culpability, but there's much more culpability in the people that duped them and lied to them. The people who fostered the big lie from Trump and his team on down. And then the Republicans who enabled it. Look, Republicans had a chance to you know, put a stop to some of this uh, by acknowledging Biden's victory, you know, when it when it happened. But, you know, they decided, oh, what's the downside to indulging Donald Trump's, you know, tantrum? And so they they stayed silent. While the president was spreading this misinformation, they stayed silent, you know, even a lot of them, even after the Electoral College votes were cast. And, and then, as you mentioned, 138 congressmen actually, you know, went along with the anti-democratic falsehoods by actually voting against counting the legitimate votes. So I got, I got to say, it's kind of a maybe, um, uh, you know, GOP leader, you know, Kevin McCarthy ought to sit this one out when he's talking about the need to heal the wounds and unify. Um no, he actually voted against counting votes after the insurrectionists breached the, breached the Capitol. So, yeah, this uh, the the fundamental big lie, the damage the big lie has done, and that's why I think we have this massive reckoning here. And, and I'm going to get to Donald Trump and the impeachment, but you know, we, we this is a really a watershed moment for the media uh, and and tech media. Maybe we'll spend some more time later talking about this. But I mean, you know, three major developments. Number one, Twitter. Kicking, ticking Donald Trump off Twitter permanently. That's number one. Number two, Parler being essentially deplatformed, which was the the much more right wing uh, version of Twitter that had no no content moderation whatsoever, in which you had the worst conspiracy theories were allowed to thrive and calls for violence were not moderated out. And then this morning we're finding out that one of the big talk radio companies in America, Cumulus, has decided that maybe this is dangerous. To have some of their big hosts, uh, like you know Mark Levin and Ben Shapiro and Don Bongino, uh, you know, spreading false stories about the election and uh, telling them, hey, you know, if you're going to keep if you're going to keep lying about the election, um, you're going to be fired. So I think I kind of get the sense that Kim, that we're kind of looking at this and going, okay, this is this is an existential crisis for American democracy, and yeah. and, and we need to do something about it. Yeah, I mean, maybe that's a silver lining. I tend to look for opportunity in dark moments, including this one. You know, the framers of the Constitution understood that populism, you know, was likely to to spread lies and then people could take actions that are against their own self-interest. Because remember, the Articles of Confederation is the precursor to the Constitution itself. And the convention was supposed to amend those articles. And the and instead, they, they chucked them and came up with this representative form of government. So the idea is in part that we have members of Congress and we have an electoral college so that cooler heads that, that really base their uh, how they act in office on the rule of law and adherence to the values of the Amer of American democracy will do what's right for their constituents. And that's what we've lost. We've lost a sense of basic decency, integrity and integrity in office. And of course, social media has just has exacerbated this problem that bothered the framers back, you know, uh, you know, Paul Revere time and horses and buggies. It took days and days to go between two cities. Now uh, it spreads within seconds across the globe. So it's their worst nightmare. And I, I think we're going to have to see also probably a different approach, frankly, to the idea of the First Amendment. I mean, that this gets distorted a lot. It does not govern. It does not control private action. So Twitter, these platforms are not bound by the First this Amendment. They can do what point. they want. Yeah. But the notion that there should be no regulation of the kind of speech that goes online doesn't – I don't think that's going to that's gonna work anymore. Um, and, of course, we regulate speech on the radio. We regulate the speech on TV, on cable. It's just that these large uh, you know, 
media, the online companies have just have so much lobbying power. It's amazing. They're stepping up to the plate and doing what our politicians won't do. And that is self-regulate. Yeah. Okay, this is a hard issue for me because I tend to be a free speech absolutist. And, and I have um, been a strong opponent of bringing back the Fairness Doctrine, which we don't have to get into right now. Uh, a year ago, I wrote a piece saying that it would be wrong to, for Twitter to ban Donald Trump, but mainly on prudential grounds, that it would allow him to be a, a martyr, that it would feed the, the right sense of victimization, which, of course, you're seeing right now. You know, I mean, right now in, in conservative media, they've already moved past the, you know, the attempted coup and they're like, this is terrible. You know, Twitter is not letting us do various things here. So it, it, it feeds that sense. And then there's also the argument that there's a danger in shoving everything underground, you know, shoving everything into, you know, in, in, into the dark corners. But I do think there's two fundamental principles here. Number one, the First Amendment does not apply to private companies. These tech companies may be very, very big, but they are private companies. And it's interesting watching conservatives basically make the case that the government should compel them to, uh, you know, allow things uh, on on their site that they don't want to allow. I mean, these are the same conservatives who were so strongly opposed to any effort to make bakers bake certain cakes, right? right. That everybody should have a free speech, right? But I also think that, that this was the shock that social media companies experienced, realizing that the cost of allowing these calls for violence and these false, you know, conspiracy theories out there, um, what, that it was deadly and that they had a fundamental moral responsibility, whatever the business consequences are, to to not allow it. And you know what? You know, they, they opted for, I mean, this is the, the flip side of free speech, that there should be consequences for irresponsible speech. There should be consequences for it. And we're seeing that playing out right now. So the rights cl claiming censorship but it's not government censorship. And to the extent to which they've been deplatformed, it's because of their unwillingness to engage in responsible, honest, decent speech. And by that, that's not what I wanted to say. To, to basically draw the line that, that if you cry fire in a crowded theater, you've crossed the line. Right. I mean, you can't possess child pornography. That's right. a crime. Uh, even if you that's how you speak or even if that's part of your religion, you can't threaten the president of the United States. I mean, most uh, with the exception of slavery, uh, the 13th Amendment, most uh, the provisions of the Constitution, there's there's a balancing test. Um, and I think this also gets distorted around the Second Amendment. There aren't these absolute rights. We're always balancing the, the rights of individuals with the rights of the or, or safety of the broader populace. And, uh, and I think, you know, just as I mentioned before, there, you can't say certain words, the famous George Carlin uh, segment, you can't say certain words on national television, but our kids can pull up pornography on their phones uh, in the middle of their Zoom class. Uh, there's a disconnect there that that is, I think, stems from a, an, a lack of political will on Congress to do the right thing. And the irony is before I sort of started doing all this public stuff, I wrote a lot about the line between the Constitution, for, between the public and the private sectors and how if, if government is privatized, there's no constitutional limits for that reason because mm. it's private. And here we're seeing the private sector under Trump step up to the plate and do what, what government won't do. So I agree with you, Charlie. We are at a crossroads. Uh, we, we have to do some real soul searching and, and hang on tight to our principles. And I think go back to a sense of decency and humanity. I mean, we, we expect it of our kids. Tell our, I have kids, you know, you tell them not to stand by while the bully is beating up the, li the little guy. And, and I think, as you mentioned before, that's what our politicians have done what, with this giant bully on the world stage and in the White House with Vladimir Putin on, you know, speed dial, presumably. <laughs> So let's talk about impeachment and, and where we're at right now. Because we're doing this on Monday morning. It looks like the House Democrats are moving ahead um, relatively quickly. They're going to have a vote uh, urging the vice president to invoke the 25th Amendment, which they'll pass that, but that won't happen. So he's Donald Trump is not going to resign. He's not going to be removed by the 25th Amendment. So they are going to move ahead with one article of impeachment accusing the president of incitement to insurrection. Before we get to that, I think it's a mistake to focus just on his speech on Wednesday as the incitement, um, incitement of violence, because I think you need to put it in context of everything the president has done in concocting this big lie since the election. And as you pointed out earlier, these people that, that invaded Congress were under the impression that Congress could overturn the election, which is a lie. They were under the impression that Mike Pence could have unilaterally turned it out. It was a lie, but these were lies specifically advanced by Donald Trump himself. And I think that's part of the incitement. 
The people were there because he lied to them. He created this scenario. He invited them, told them to be strong and to fight. And so in terms of incitement, it's not just the speech on Wednesday. It's basically everything he has been doing since the election. Right. And his attack on people like Pence, um, suggesting that they would endanger themselves if they didn't uh, push against Biden's win. And also it's his speech after uh, when he called, he said that he loved them. Um, it's sort of praise and encouragement for for this kind of behavior. I, you know, I had um, on my IGTV show on yes, just yesterday on um, Simple Politics, I had Ellie Honig from CNN. Mm prosecutor. And he said, listen, this is not a complicated case. Uh, If this were brought uh, before a jury, uh, a seasoned prosecutor could make the case in a day or two. It's a, it's a, this is, this is not like we saw, say with the impeachment trial, the first round, Uh, this is pretty straight up stuff. And the question uh, all along with Donald Trump is where are the tickets for speeding? I just think whether it's impeachment or the 25th amendment or the 14th amendment, or of course he's not going to resign. We as Americans can't stand idly by and say it's okay for the president to literally incite an attack, a rebellion against a co-equal branch of government. I mean, that I just we're past the breaking point, Charlie. Yeah. I, I don't know what people are thinking. Do you really want something other than democracy? And and my call then is to these people, Republicans that are still stoking this, put it on the table. What's your alternative? Because that's what they've been fighting for and arguing for, something other than self-governance. Okay, what do you want? You want (laughs) kleptocracy, oligarchy, authoritarianism, monarchy? I mean, let's have the honest debate because that's really where we are right now. So upside, there are upsides and downsides to impeachment, which are obvious. Where do, where do you come down right now? Because this is going to be decided by the House of Representatives in the next three days. What should I think they do? They, I th- absolutely think they should impeach him. I, I, I mean, I think I think that um, Mike Pence should, you know, should also invoke the Twenty Fifth Amendment. And this is the, the reason is this, Charlie. Uh, I mean, part of it is what we've been talking about that you have to just you have to have boundaries, or the Constitution is meaningless. You know, it's it's like a speed camera that no one gets tickets for. So you just blow through it every single day. That's what the Constitution is becoming. But I just wonder about what do we not know about the next how many days? Um, We also know that it was it wasn't covered very heavily because of everything else going on, that the Russians have been hacking over 250 um, government and private servers for the past eight months, including the Department of Energy, which of course houses the nuclear codes. We know that Donald Trump uh, fired the defense secretary or secretary kind of randomly, SB in December, and that the, the current uh, stand-in was, was not very robust in, in getting reinforcements in the Capitol. And that basic, the basic sort of crowd management, notwithstanding, you know, the the sort of more artillery focused type of support around the United States Capitol when the Congress was sitting just wasn't there. I, I'm just I just worry about the safety of the United States of America domestically from more terrorists between now and January 20th. And we haven't had a briefing from the White House or the FBI. We, we don't know what happened. So to me, it's kind of you know, you could say, well, uh, you know, we're hearing, oh, it's divisive and it's politically risky. Yeah, but but so is this massive unknown um, of more chaos and violence and and even a worse outcome. That's what worries me. In my mind, it's like the safe thing to do is just put Mike Pence in charge, period. Well, I agree with you. And, and let me just go. I mean, I, I think there's three main reasons to do this. Number one, um, Donald Trump needs to be held accountable for his misconduct. That's number one for, you know, when the president of the United States, um, you know, sed- seditiously in- incites insurrection against a co branch of government, uh, he needs to be held accountable for that. That's number one. Number two, it, you know, it, we need to protect the country from what he might do. And I'm going to get come back to that in a moment. And I think that that's a real, real legitimate threat. Number three is also the precedent. Is our president, which you've talked about over and over again, you know, does the Constitution actually mean anything? Do other, you know, will a future president be able to get away with this? But let me go back to this threat that he poses right now. I have to tell you that over the weekend, my my view on this has has started to shift a little bit, actually rather significantly. I guess I I, I don't want to say that I'm naive here because I've been, you know, talking about Donald Trump for so long. But I, I guess 
I had assumed that much of what he was doing was posturing in order to raise money, in order to position himself, that it was Donald Trump, no, knowing that he had lost the election, but simply wanting to be able to play the victim card, right? The stab in the back. And then you launch whatever it is you want to do. You launch your media enterprise, you launch your 2024 campaign, but it was all it was all basically marketing and grift and positioning. Now, of course, it had did tremendous damage to uh, the country. But I think the more you find out about these phone calls he was making, the things he was doing, this man sitting in the White House was trying to overturn this election. I mean, I don't know how else you you, you describe the, the calls and the threats to the Secretary of State in Georgia, the fact that he actually called one of the investigators. He was trying to overturn this election, which suggests a degree of delusion, but also desperation that ought to be scary because if he's capable of doing all of that, what is he still capable of doing? Precisely. And of course, we know that the transition efforts were stalled for weeks. We know that, uh, I mean, I don't know what the latest is on this, but Joe Biden, you know, not that long ago tweeted about not having access to, you know, national security data to the level that he needed for the transition. I, I just don't, it's just one big black hole. And given this man, Donald Trump's history, and frankly, given his coziness with the Russians, I mean, we have just no idea what's going on. We just don't know. And I don't think it's going to be, as you indicate, something that shores up our defenses and supports American democracy and peaceful transition of power and the longevity of our constitutional system. It's just not. So it's like any risk benefit calculus. I think the risks that we saw, I mean, imagine, Charlie, if that mob had got, had actually actually been a couple minutes, mm-hmm. uh, come, come a couple minutes later and got a hold of Nancy Pelosi or got a hold of Mike Pence, um, not to mention, of course, the, the extraordinarily, you know, excruciating sort of, you know, way that this sh- sh- is different from what we saw with Black Lives Matter, the whole racist connotation. But I live right outside Washington. I know you spend a lot of time mm-hmm. here. Washington knows how to do protests. <laughs> you know, they, they know this. It's I, I sat there with my mouth hanging open watching the television, having been down on the mall so many times. I mean, the the basics of basics of basics, um, you know, mounted police and barriers and crowd control and actual, you know, physical force to 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 manage the crowds, to single file them, um, bomb sniffing dogs. I mean, there yeah. were there were bombs. It's it was like it, it it's hard to not think. I mean, J- Jim Clyburn's laptop was stolen from one of his inner offices. What, what a, I, I just, it, it's terrifying, Charlie. It's it is, terrifying. it is terrifying. And the more we find out about it, the more terrifying it is. And n- number one, of course, there was, you know, tremendous evidence in advance that this was planned. This was going on. Uh, ben Collins from NBC has said, you know, you follow them online. And there was a big debate about who they were going to kill, what weapons to bring. Um, you had people, you know, talking about hanging Mike Pence. Now, is that just rhetorical? Um, or did they, they actually mean it? News, why, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, why did they bring in the zip ties? What was that all about? And also, look, folks, we apparently did not learn the lesson of what happened in Michigan, where we had these arrests of these men who were trying to get a plot to kidnap and possibly murder the governor of Michigan and other government officials in Michigan. This is out there. It is still out there. It is incredibly dangerous. And 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 yet security whiffed. Do you have any theory about what what could have possibly happened here? You know, I'll, I I this is pure speculation. But as a you know constitutional law professor, right? I, I teach about the branches of government and the various um, scope of the power of the three branches, with, with the exception of the Capitol Police, who were kind of winging it um, on their own. Uh, you know, law enforcement answers, federal law enforcement answers to the president of the United States. Uh, I, I don't know, but like he cleaned a lot of house when it comes to his top officials just in the month of December. I, I just, you know, he is, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, the, the buck stops here. They all, they answer to him. I, I don't know. We are going to need a, you know, a nine 11 like commission, like America has perhaps never seen before that will, that needs to get to the bottom of all of this spectacular failure 
uh, when we had members of Congress crouching on the floor with hazmat gear, you know, Nancy Pelosi calling the Virginia governor, others calling Larry Hogan saying, please help us send in These someone to protect us. And then the, the governors are saying, we're not, we don't have the authority. We're not getting the okay from the Defense Department, which statutorily ha- has co- uh, jurisdiction over the, the state national guards. That hasn't always been the case, but you know it's hard. It's hard not to wonder who mucked up the system, particularly given Trump and his family were having a party to you know '80s disco music when when the rally was happening um, before they marched to the Capitol at his at his recommendation. And the and the the, the, the most dramatic reality check is the death is the death toll. Five dead, and maybe six if you add in the uh, the other officer that committed suicide afterwards. But one of the dead, including a police officer, and, and and I have to keep coming back to the the way in which Trumpists had wrapped themselves in the blue flag. You know, blue lives matter. We back the blue. The support for cops. Uh, you know, all of the rhetoric about riots and support for law enforcement. And then you're looking at this video of these protesters using American flags to beat police, or capital police officer or officers um, either to death or seriously injured. I don't know in, in, the, in the video that I've seen who it is, but you would think that there would be more shock in the in Trump world. Apparently it took till yesterday for the White House to even lower its flag to half mast for right. for the officer that died. Yeah. And then the officers of color talking about, you know, the racial slurs that were used against them over and over again. I mean, that one Capitol Police officer passed away. He was hit in the head with a fire extinguisher. There's another video of one having his head in a in a vice, basically at a doorway. Oh, that's um, I, I don't know, Charlie. I, I think we just have to, you know, people are, I don't want to hear about it. This is hard. This is painful. We have to look at this. We have to look at this steely eyed in the face and ask ourselves, where are we headed? You know, we are careening over a cliff. And I think it's worth saving for my children. I think American democracy is worth, sa- worth saving. But that's going to require going back to our own sense of decency. That's what you and I are talking about. This kind of sense that this is just not how you act in the world. And what the co- same kind of standards we hold for our people who take care of our kids or our teachers or our religious leaders or whatever, that should apply to our politicians as well. And we've gotten so think. far from that. Yeah. You you would think it would apply. Okay, so so let's look, we're, here we are. It's it's Monday. It is January eleventh. Uh, nine days from now, Donald Trump ceases to be president. Now, I agree with you. The Trump should be impeached and removed from office immediately, but that's not going to happen. I mean, it's, it's just it's not. You know, there, there's not going to be a twenty fifth amendment, and the Senate is not going to take up this trial. It's not going to vote to oust him before January 20th. Okay, so this is the huge dilemma that everybody faces now. But you can't, if you take no action, then Trump gets away with this. The precedent is like horrible. Uh, but if you go ahead with this, or particularly the Senate goes ahead with this, it might actually consume uh, the first days of the of the Biden administration. So you, you can understand the, the, the tension here. So Jim Clyburn, you know, number three, mm-hmm. Uh, number three Democrat in the House, Democrat from South Carolina, obviously a very, very important ally of Biden, uh, is basically proposing delaying. You know, do you vote? You vote to impeach, but then you withhold it. Let Biden have his first hundred days, and then you do it. Now I understand that people are frustrated about that, but I, I just want to bounce this off you. Impeachment is the only viable route to get rid of Donald Trump. That's not the only route to hold him accountable. So you know that I'm, I'm kind of playing with this idea of two tracks. You got the political track, the constitutional track, then you have the judicial track. So uh, you withhold the impeachment. You don't have the trial. You don't suck up the oxygen. It's not going to r- remove him anyway. But on January 20th, you have the Biden administration announce the appointment of a special counsel that you're going to impanel a ground, grand jury that is going to investigate the whole thing, including Donald Trump's role. So on two tracks, Biden gets to go ahead with his agenda, gets to do stuff, but and the impeachment is still there. It's on the table. It's in abeyance. And meanwhile, this investigation is gathering evidence. The grand jury is uh, gathering evidence, possibly handing down indictments. And when that happens, then you bring it back to the Senate. And the key at that point is the Senate can, can't remove him anymore because he's out of office, but it can disqualify him. Does this make sense, this two-track approach? I mean, on a number of levels, it does, because remember, we're having, you know, record numbers of deaths and, you know, one in a thousand Americans are dead from COVID and one in 10 in California have been infected. I mean, there are 
you know, that the house is on fire in other areas and he does have to use Biden, his political capital uh, to deal with these other urgent, urgent matters, with many of which um, fall in part at the feet of Donald Trump. Um, but I have a couple concerns. One is that, uh, first of all, I think we we can anticipate potentially a self-pardon between now right. and January 20th. I, you know, I thought this even before the 6th, that will be a major body blow to the U.S. Constitution. And that's going to pose for Biden and for Merrick Garland, assuming he, which I assume he's going to get through confirmation, the new attorney general, they're going to have to decide whether to not nonetheless potentially prosecute and indict a president um, and then have litigated the legitimacy of a self-pardon as a defense to that indictment. That's mm-hmm. a big one. Big. But um, but the other thing is, you know, even to se- censure and say, listen, Donald, you cannot run again in 2024, which, you know, as you say, basically impeachment's like a trial. The House can indict. So the House will indict this week, which is a good thing. That's a message. Mm-hmm. We're serious. Then the Senate convicts. And then there's the sentencing phase. The, for this conviction, there still needs two thirds mm-hmm. of the majority in the Senate. So what I don't want to see happen is a hundred days passes. People see this in the rearview mirror. You know, the cries of drama and politics around impeachment get stronger, and there's no conviction again. I, that to me would almost be worse. Uh, you, you know, in terms of what it does to the Constitution to say it's okay essentially to to do what Donald Trump did to the United States Congress. And I worry about that. Um, so and that would have to be in place in order to mm-hmm. impose the ban on running again. But I have a piece coming out in the Hill today that also uses this legal term called nunk pro tunk, which essentially means that I don't know why, like judges do, they couldn't remove him nunk pro tunk to meaning if you look backwards to uh, January 20th at 1159 a.m., and then the benefit of that is he'd lose his security detail, potentially. He would lose his $200,000 a year uh, stipend salary that he gets for the rest of his life, a million dollars travel budget, uh, you know, a, a GSA-funded office and office staff. Um, the first lady gets gets uh, certain kinds of benefits. I mean, you know, there is something to be said for not having him have the auspices of the presidency for the rest of his life. That would also be litigated. But frankly, Charlie, I'd like to see some of this go to the Supreme Court and have them put their put put their their take a stand on this. Uh, I think they'll come out differently than than politicians. I, I do think that it's important to finally put to rest the idea that the president of the United States can can pardon himself. I mean, that 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 is such a radical thing when you think about it. It is so fundamentally anti-democratic that essentially says the president of the United States can be the judge in his own case and put himself above the law. And and, and I think that's kind of the shock of one of the many shocks of of the Trump era is finding out how fragile some of these norms were if you had somebody like Donald Trump. Now, I've heard you also talk about other kinds of legislation, speaking of lessons that we've learned. Um, And I know that you're working on a piece that that lays out some other things that we need to do to protect ourselves against uh, coming back to where we are right now. Yeah. So I actually have a a big law review article coming out in one of the Stanford law journals this spring on that policy against indicting a sitting president. I mean, I don't know if Joe Biden's going to step up to the plate and say, yeah, I'm indictable, but I do think that needs to change for a lot of reasons. It's very poorly analyzed. It's old. It's from early, from Nixon and then Clinton. Um, Because right now, as you indicate, it's bookended. Can't indict him when he's sitting. And if he self-pardons, can't indict him on the other way out. There are a few other things that have led to this. Um, you know, we have a couple days left. I'll just start with recent going backwards. And as you indicate, this piece will come out in the Atlantic later this week. The Insurrection Act, um, you know, there are questions as to whether it's constitutional itself, but it essentially allows the president to declare martial law. And there are some, you know, peep crazies online that are saying that's around the pike. Who knows? But that needs to be pulled back. There has to be, you know, originally the Insurrection Act um, required a judge to, to weigh in to say there is an emergency condition that would require that would authorize the use of the military, notwithstanding the Posse Comitatus Act, um, which is the statute that essentially says you can't use the military on civilians. That needs to change. We also need to change the timing of the electoral process. We have 11 weeks between the election and the inauguration. That is way too much time for shenanigans. Congress can't change the inauguration date. That's in the Constitution, but could move up the uh, the election date. And also remember that 
that silliness with yeah that's that's statutorily established the the first that that November date um the silliness with the GSA administrator holding up you know bureaucratically access to transition dollars that statute needs to be amended to take that amount of power away from an unelected bureau, bureaucrat and in addition the electoral count act needs to be changed. Now, this is that old statute we've been talking about all along. Two elements. Yes. Two elements really important. Remember when we heard all this lawsuits that we heard about, you know, uh, from from Republicans, from the Trump campaign, trying to get legislators to basically change the law and hand the Electoral College votes to Trump. That's in the arguably in that statute that needs to change and make it clear the popular vote controls the Electoral College. Congress needs to do that. Secondly, the Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz nonsense we saw even after videos were circulating of the attack on the on the uh, on the Congress, they were saying, uh, you know, listen, we we object to the votes. It should be really clear in the Electoral Count, Count Act that members of Congress don't have the ability to just arbitrarily on political grounds to challenge the certification. They need actual evidence. I think th- that should also change so that we can avoid this stuff going forward. These and are that's, easy and that's very doable. I mean, that's a statute. That's a, a statutory change because in the Constitution itself, there's no provision for objecting. In the Constitution, they just count it. That whole process of the one senator, one congressman objecting, and then having the debate and being able to vote against it—that's all part of that 1887 Act. Right. Yeah. And and up until exactly. And up until now, you know, this goes back to my point about integrity and decency. People have just followed the rules for the sake of the institution, which is partly why we've probably see people like Mitch McConnell now finally turning on the president. Um, We now have QAnon members in the United States Congress. There need to be more limits on you know, playing the play in the joints for political game and distortion. And uh, I think, as you indicate, these are not complicated thousands of pages of bills that would throw everything into constitutional flux, easy fixes, clean fixes. One of the ironies of all of this, of course, is that two of the people who are most what, what is the word I want to use? Um, you know, I, obviously have been some of the worst actors in all of this. Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley are two of the most highly educated lawyers in the, in the Senate. They would claim to be constitutional scholars. <laughs> you, you may disagree with all of that. That's one of the most depressing things about it is the fact that they know better. And I think that that needs to be emphasized is that the, you have people like Louis Gohmert who are just, I mean, too, too dumb to live. You know, I mean, he's just, I mean, he's Louis Gohmert. But, but Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, these guys went to elite law schools. Right? Josh, Hawley clerked, Josh Hawley clerked for the chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, John yeah, Robert. Think about that. I mean, I am, you know, I've been teaching law full time. I'm tenured for 15, 16 years, you know, and I've never had the experience I've had in the Trump administration where I'm teaching, you know, basic ethics that are part and parcel of every course. I mean, there's a separate course on professional responsibility. I don't teach that, but I do teach where the boundaries are of, you know, making arguments that are based in law and based in fact. And the fact that essentially there's a higher noble cause to being a lawyer. You are, you are the engine of justice in a lot of ways. Um, and my students are like, why should we, I don't understand what, why, why are these lawyers getting away with this? Why is Rudy Giuliani able to do this? And I have to kind of say, well, you know, almost like I say to my kids, maybe that's how those kids do it, but we do it differently in my family. And I'm having to tell the students, listen, this isn't the way to go. It's absolutely stunning because to get to those levels, those law schools, those, you know, to clerk on the U.S. Supreme Court, you have to be at the at the very, very, very top of your game. Uh, and, and and law school's hard. It, it's it's really, really tough. Okay, but go back to your the question by your 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 students, which I think is, is excellent. I mean, leave, leaving aside Holly and Cruz just for the moment, the lawyers who have been, who have filed some of these lawsuits, you know, the Lynn Woods, the Rudy Giuliani's, the Jenna Ellis's, uh, the uh, Sidney Powell's, uh, are they going to get away with this? I mean, are will the legal profession, does legal profess, uh, profession have the means and the will to sanction them for what they have done? You know, I haven't I haven't been sort of up to speed on the latest on that, but I did do a big piece in the in Politico on the fact that Rule 11 of the Federal Rules of a Procedure in federal court does require that you have facts and law. And that there are lots of those lawyers and the lawsuits filed in Pennsylvania that violated, in my mind, 
pretty clearly, or at least there's a strong case, but that requires other lawyers to ask for sanctions or the judges to do it sui sponte. I'm not sure that's happened. And it's just like we've seen with the Constitution. If there aren't tickets for speeding, people will speed. The other thing is the bar. Uh, and, you know, the bar can can take up complaints and and do investigations and basically disbar some of these people or sanction some of these people. And, and I hope it happens because otherwise, you know, I'm screaming into the wind when I'm trying. I tell my students, listen, your reputation is everything. You can play dirty or you can play fair. And if you have a reputation for playing fair, you can do a lot, a lot of good, not just for society, but for your client, because people respect you and they know that you that you're to be trusted. Um, and I, I don't know; it's just so hard to have to establish these basics again. Um, and we may, we may have to. However, let, let let's let's end on a, on a good news note because mm -hmm. we've been talking about you know how fragile our institutions have turned out to be, how vulnerable they've turned out to be, um, and how disappointing th this has been. Uh, you know, the flip side of this is as we look back over the last two months, the role of the federal and state judiciary that you know that they stood as a to use the term used stood as a bulwark against all of this bullshit. I mean, not yeah. one court. Well, actually, what they won one minor case in Pennsylvania. But other than that, every single level, state courts, state appeals courts, state supreme courts, federal district courts, federal appeals courts, the U.S. Supreme Court, all of them basically stood against what Trump was doing. They knocked him down at every single level. This is an extraordinary moment, especially when you think about how many of those were Trump appointees, Federalist Society types, that the conservative judiciary actually act like conservative judges rather than right-wing Trumpist judges. So I take some encouragement from that, that of all of the institutions that that you know, did the right thing, um, the judiciary covered itself with some glory here, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, and then I agree. And um, that's sort of, we can thank the framers for that. In part, they they made them, they gave them life tenure because they didn't want the federal judges to be worrying about being reelected. They're not politicians. They're there for life and they can't be penalized at the polls for making an unpopular decision. I would just say, you know, this new 6-3 majority, uh, I think after witnessing what happened on the 6th, if, if one of these questions of, of presidential power comes up to the U.S. Supreme Court, I think they are going to be less likely um, to give presidents, you know, in quotes, a pass on having more power, which I don't know if they hadn't, if we hadn't witnessed this trauma. Sometimes it takes, like we said in the top of the show, we've been saying this, people thought we were exaggerating. Now it's happened. And so, you know, when the Supreme Court lays down the law around the constitution, it's almost like amending the constitution. So in a way, now they know what, what the, what the stakes are. And I think we will see better, better sort of uh, guardrails out of this court than perhaps we might've seen with this conservative. I, majority. I think you're right about that because you know what? I think that they understand at some level, what? this could have been them. Can you yeah. imagine a yes. scenario in which mm -hmm. they were hearing a case that would have decided this election? You know, if they would have made the mistake of taking it and the the, the mob had been turned on the Supreme Court. And can, yes. you imagine, can you imagine if the court had been the, uh, the, the, the the target of this, what that would have been like for the justices? And I'm guessing that the justices understand that. They go, you yeah. know what? You know, if they're willing to go after a joint session of Congress, counting the Electoral College votes, they would be willing to come after us if we were hearing a case that that the Trumpists had had told the crowd um, was going might result in, in the overturning of their American democracy, et cetera. Yeah. And they're going to have to think about this with the First Amendment. I mean, one thing back to that, I mean, I'm also a big believer in speech, free speech, but not to the point where, you know, people are lied to from every outlet and we have this kind of outcome. We have to modulate this. But this court is going to be more open to free speech or religion, religious rights than I think prior courts, more more progressive courts. And again, if you can see the the, the worst case scenario, I'm sure they all they have friends on the hill. Um, they might have you know have family members that are staffers, nieces, nephews, whatever. I mean, these people, as you know, in Washington, uh, tend to know each other. That that this is this was scary. This was absolutely scary. I also want to just highlight another like sort of light um, another a piece I did last week, I think, for the Hill. That one thing with the defense bill which is actually astonishing that made it through with along with the defense bill, which of course um, they, the Congress overrode the president's veto is a ban on anonymous 
uh, incognito federal officers. And I think hmm. that was that was also a plus for democracy, because if you remember over the summer in front of Lafayette Square, there were people, you know, looking like armed militia that were really sort of prison guards from BOP or, you know, various places, of the government that that uh, former Attorney General Barr had deputized. And there was no law, federal law in place that said they had to indicate who they were and who they worked for. And that's that's change. Now they have to. Um, some states already required it, but the federal government didn't. And I just thought that was kind of amazing. That it that is happened. kind of amazing. Do we, do we know how that came about? Yeah, I have it in the piece. And unfortunately, I don't have the uh, the names of the, the two House mm-hmm. members who, who sponsored it. But one um, woman was, you know, she had a military background and was concerned and, and saw this. And, and it went through without objection, which is, that is a win for individual rights. Because if you don't know who to sue, you can't sue. Right. No, that, and, that, that is. And the job. piggyback militias, too. It's like, no, no, no. If you show up without a badge, you're not going to pr- be able to pretend that you're federal law enforcement. Well, this is the other thing, because as, as you watch the videotapes of some of these events, you see people who are showing up in what looks like military um, you know, armor and uh, you know, tactical gear and everything. So the, the, the lines have blurred. Um, and I think that's one of the most disturbing aspects of what we are up against now. Kim Whaley, thank you so much for joining me again on a really consequential day in what is going to be a very, very consequential couple of weeks, the final full week of the Trump presidency, where actually he has less than a Scaramucci left to be president. It's a nail biter, Charlie, and always great to talk to talk it through with you. Thanks and for thank, having me. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.